Fantastic. So welcome everybody. Still just a few people joining. Um, so this is the fourth uh, session of the Policy Influencers Network Group as convened by us, the Urban Agriculture Consortium. So myself and Jeremy Isles here are the coordinators of the UAC. And um, we're really uh, convening this space as a place for creative thought, um, questioning, connection, um, all around things to do with policy related to um, urban, peri-urban agroecology and how we create more of it. Um, it's obviously very cross-cutting, so um, it's great to be focusing this session on land use and planning and urban food security, um, which stands in for lots <coughs> of things about resilience and, um, and justice and equality and um, thinking about climate and all kinds of, all kinds of things. Um, so we're really pleased to welcome um, Simon Rustin, uh, Lucy Taylor, Martin Elliott, and we'll also have um, Ario Feldman, um, who'll be coming in a bit later in uh, to represent the work of Sustain and Gillian from Sustain, has, uh, who heads up their planning work, has kindly um, sent us some slides to share yes. as well. So we'll just, um, we will, I think, um, what would be great is if, well, Jeremy, maybe would you like to um, do a little intro? Yeah. And, um, and then it would be quite nice to, I might just bung you all in, uh, in a breakout room with a couple of other people just to introduce yourselves because an important part of this these ping sessions is that we connect with each other and we see each other kind of face to face as much as we can on zoom so do you want to do the intro first jeremy or should we do our our breakout no, let's just do, let's just do a quick run through the the intro um great uh, really amazing there's 40 people in this group now or 38 um and that's the highest number we've had in a ping so far and that doesn't count all the people who've registered and we know that quite a lot of you haven't so welcome friends old and new um some of you I haven't seen for a few years so this very quickly the policy influencers network group came out of consultations of the um urban agriculture consortium in its first year uh, which was 2020 2021 and we work quite intensively with five northern cities and various other partners to get this up and running. And the whole process has been co-designed with people on the ground. So it's actually emerged that one of the things people were most concerned about was uh, traction with local planning departments and how do you gain access to land for new community food growing at all levels. So we're talking about community gardens, allotments and more and more um, farm starts, etc. So this is the map of the where participants that we know about in this meeting today so that's pretty amazing geographical spread you'll see there's one of you down in near the silly isles and one somewhere out on the dogger bank and that's because we've got some email addresses uh, that we couldn't locate geographically so if you if you aren't represented on the map perhaps just put your, your name in the chat and tell us where you are um so the, the way the ping works it is that all voices are equal. So whether you're, whether you're from a local charity, an NGO, or from a local authority, your voice counts as much as ever anybody else's in this space. And it's a space for exploration to connect with each other, to explore, learn, and make progress. And we assume you're all interested in the subject of land use and urban food security. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. And we see our role, um, Maddie said, we are two part-time workers running this project and we can't do everything and clearly we're connecting with a lot of well-established and new initiatives uh, equally and we try and collaborate and build partnerships with them so what our role if you like is to try and act as a conduit and uh, a catalyst perhaps for 
looking at our expectations, aspirations, and, and hoping to amplify and accelerate the progress of urban agriculture at all levels. What we will be looking for today is policy case studies for our forthcoming wider interest network meeting there on the 8th of June. And we need examples of policies adopted or under development by local authorities in support of more sustainable urban food. So we'll be putting up a Mentimeter later on for you to have a little, put, put, that sort of, put some examples in there if you've got them or contact us later because we're trying to compile that so we can showcase good practice later on. So this is what we're gonna do. Bit of context, a Mentimeter question, a breakout, presentations as um, Maddie's already mentioned, and then some more breakout rooms at the end, another Mentimeter saying, let's create the, pan pl the planning policies we'd like to have in an ideal world. And you can use that space to be as ambitious and aspirational as you wish. So just in context, I probably don't need to repeat this, but daily now we are getting reminders that our food system isn't ready for the climate crisis. The food system isn't fit for purpose. We're getting reports from IPCC, from the Food Research Co Collaboration and many others about food insecurity and growing instability in the food sector. And our aspirations back in 2016, when we started this project was to create more urban food growing in the UK. And that was before Brexit, before COVID, before the present conflicts, et cetera. So the situation is amplified, if you like, daily. And um, you probably all know that. So I'm not gonna to go too much into that, but we're also seeing things like the 20 minute neighborhood from TCPA and around the globe of planners trying to relocalize all aspects of urban life into a 20 minute neighborhood. And that includes food growing. And Maddie and I work with TCPA to make sure that food growing was included within that 20 minute framework. But just to bring us bang up to date, just yesterday, Maddie was talking with the Community Land Trust and Bristol City Council about the possibility of transferring city council land to the Community Land Trust for localised food growing in every ward of Bristol. And that was apparently a quite a positive meeting. And last night, there was a talk from City University from Professor Andrea Freeman from the University of Hawaii talking about the collusion between governments and corporations that creates food oppression based upon the colonial system. And it's, this is all stuff that's going on out there in the academic world, which is interesting to me and also new to me. And then just today, this morning, Sustain held a seminar on the cost of living crisis and sustainable food. And hopefully we'll hear, for, hear a bit about that from Emily later on. Actually, as we're speaking, Incredible Edible are launching their Right to Grow campaign in the House of Lords which we had to decline our invites to because we were here and this is taking place right now. So we feel that this is um, a very pertinent, hang on, pertinent discussion, go on down the other way. And that's the end of my slides by the looks of it. So yeah. I'll hand back to Maddie. <laughs> Brilliant. That's a great intro. Thank you, Jeremy. So I'm just going to, um, Put you all into breakout rooms just for a few minutes to say to each other there'll be two or three people per room just to connect with each other say who you are where you are you know something about what what brings you here um just make sure that you have a minute or so each so um here we go really connected this yeah. meeting is being recorded Ooh. Thanks, Jeremy. I think that's everyone back in. Hopefully you haven't lost anyone in cyberspace yeah. between the two places. Um, great. So we're going to, we've got um, four presentations, really. Um, I'm going to um, be Gillian for the first one and present her slides. Um, and then her colleague Ario is going to sort of step in when he arrives um, shortly. So, um, right, here we go. Let's see if I can share my screen. Hmm. It says loading. 
which is a bit ominous. Uh, maybe that's it. Okay. Right. Can everybody see that? It says planning a planning a good food environment. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So um, Gillian Morgan, as many of you might know, is, um, um, I think there's somebody else, um, Jeremy, that just needs to be admitted. You might keep an eye on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, Gillian Morgan is um, heads up the planning for food uh, work at Sustain. And she's very kindly sort of um, given us these slides to give an overview of the current sort of national context. So I'm going to um, just speak to her, her slides. I won't embellish. Um, there's her email if you need it. And maybe if, um, if anyone could um, mute themselves, if you're not muted, I think maybe Lindsay, that's coming from you. Um, hmm. I'm trying to change my slide and it's not working. Don't you just love this sort of? Um, hmm. Let me try that again. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Talk amongst yourselves. Do you want me to try it, Maddie? Yeah, maybe. Let me just try this one more time. Uh... Okay, can you, what are you seeing now? Still, uh, it just says it's loading, but it's not doing anything. Okay. Yeah, still loading. Okay, sorry about this, everyone. Uh, always happens when you don't least need it. Uh... There's still nothing. Yeah, still nothing. Still nothing. Okay. Um, do you want to try, Jeremy? I'll sort of see if I can get in. Hang on. It says participants can now see your application. I'm yeah, going. so we can see the first slide. Okay. Is that in, to... in present mode or? Yes. It, it, yeah, you, you can, it, it's covering the whole screen. Okay. Can you click through it? Has that yeah. changed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hooray. Thanks. Okay. So I will um, whip through these. So food is a spatial planning issue. And it sounds like a very obvious statement, but it's not often... Food and spatial planning in many situations aren't kind of brought together. Um, what does a sustainable food place look like? So it can be defined by access to healthy food, such as protection of local shops, encouragement of food markets, location of hot food takeaways, and space for 
community gardens and food production in as part of major housing or other developments. In, integrating edible planting and species for biodiversity uh, into landscaping schemes and agri agricultural land in the urban fringe and green belt, making sure that that is in productive use. So with the national planning framework, um, there are a number of different references that relate to food and space for food. Um, one is around healthy and safe communities. So paragraph 92, planning policies and decisions which aim to achieve healthy, inclusive and safe places, which promote social interaction, are safe and accessible, and enable and support healthy lifestyles and specifically through the provision of safe and accessible green infrastructure, local shops, access to healthier food and allotments. So vague, but it's there. And um, planning practice guidance, uh, relating to how planning can create a healthier food environment. Planning can influence the built environment to improve health, reduce obesity and excess weight in local communities. Local planning authorities can have a role by supporting opportunities for communities to access a wide range of healthier food production and consumption choices. So there it starts to allude to the connection across the food system between production and consumption and then we that relates also to thinking about how we shorten supply chains how we make food growing um, accessible to um, everybody in every neighborhood to give them equal um, opportunity to connect with land and nature and good food in this way so there's a national design code um, adopted in 2021, and it talks about well-designed places and highlights food production as one way um, of creating, using open spaces to create enjoyable, attractive, healthy, uh, socially inclusive activity. Um, that's part of a well-designed space. Um, open space, and the, in the guidance notes, open space design, uh, it also talks about allotments and community growing. We need to consider community growing projects for food production, learning and community engagement and include communal open spaces in new developments to promote the health and well-being of residents. And through, for that, we can also read uh, by providing access to community food production. Um, so this, um, she's included this from Brighton and Hove, um, which Emily probably knows a lot more about than, than I do. Um, so it's a way of, Um, identifying what kind of um, food related activity could happen in different kinds of spaces, um, right through from um, balconies to large greenfield sites. So if you're looking into any kind of urban environment, you will find space and opportunity for um, healthy food production. And we need to look at it at all these scales, sort of micro and macro. And so here's a really good um, selection of support for councils, for all of you that are coming from a council context and working in a council context. Um, and, and possibly often finding uh, difficulty working across all the different departments that food systems thinking requires. Um, 
there's a great uh, selection of toolkits now that are very up to date um, that you can um, work through as teams and across departments. And these these um, these slides and these links will be shared on the Urban Ag Consortium website um, after this session as well. So that's um, that was Gillian's piece. Thank you, Gillian, for that. And just want to welcome Gillian's colleague, Ario, who's arrived. Um, I'll stop sharing and maybe you'd like to just add something, um, Ario? If you are in the house. Can't hear you. Yeah, brilliant. So Ario's recently taken over from Rob Logan in the coordination of the National Fringe Farming Project, which is a really um, critical piece in um, when we're looking at food security, um, short supply chains, and um, city region planning. Um, yeah, you should be able to hear me now. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Brilliant, good, yeah. welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Maddie, for um, presenting Julian's slides as well. Um, yeah, so, so obviously I'm um, a bit more centered on uh, peri-urban spaces, but I think obviously th th there is some overlap with the, the concerns and obstacles of urban agriculture, um, especially when it comes to um, getting new entrants into farming and looking at local um, food supply and, and also working at smaller scales. Um, I think the main difference is peri-urban farming tends to be uh, larger and um, also uh, there's more room for uh, creating um, enterprise uh, due to the scale. Um, and then, but anyway, with, with the overlap, um, I'll be interested to hear what, what happens in this meeting. Um, and uh, one thing I wanted to plug was we're having a, a national event in uh, June, June the 14th. Well, I can put it in the chat as well. And, and this will happen in Westminster and we'll be lobbying some of our key asks um, to politicians, so MPs and uh, also members of parliament in Scotland and, and uh, Wales, uh, as well as, uh, yes, yeah, so across party as well. Um, and, and the idea is just to kind of uh, increase the visibility of uh, the idea of peri-urban agriculture um, and, and, and give space for kind of dialogue between uh, also practitioners uh, with, with politicians. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Um, I'll also put my email address in case you, you want to know more about the, the fringe farming campaign um, and potential links also with the work you're doing. Brilliant, thank you, Ario, lovely to see you. Um, does anyone have any um, immediate thoughts or um, questions relating to any of Gillian's slides or um, what Ario said? If you, um, I can't necessarily see you all on one uh, screen, so do use your, go to reactions and use your like, put your hand up function um, and also you, you can um, type things into the into the chat I'm going to at this point um, introduce um, a Mentimeter link into the chat so I don't know if some of you might be familiar with Mentimeter um, you should just be able to click on that link, that menti.com link, and it will open a separate page. So it'll take you away from this page uh, uh, to a separate page where hopefully you will see um, a, the Mentimeter and a question um, that should say, if this is all working properly, 
And um, what's one thing you've heard or learnt that will help you make policy progress or overcome a barrier or challenge in your place or your work? Is that, can you see that? Is that coming up on your mentee? Fabulous. So as we go through um, that presentation of just, just done, but as we also go through uh, Martin and Lucy and Simon's presentations, um, please use that to, to log, to just write down in summary, things that are really like, um, you know, clicking for you, something that's come up that is, uh, yeah, really makes sense or um, anything that relates specifically to, to your situation and helping you move through whatever your situation is. Um, and you don't have to be doing it all the time. You can do it at the end of all three presentations or you can just do it as you go along. I wanted to put it in now because obviously thoughts will arise and you'll want to capture things often as you go, as you go through, as you hear them while well, they're fresh. Um, or you can just write them down on a piece of paper um, as well, put them in at the end. So um, is, it, is anyone having... Okay, so Deborah is saying that you can't access it. Ah, what happens when you click on the link? It's just telling me I've got access denied. Oh, okay. Well, maybe if you're happy to, um, Deborah, you can just type anything into the chat under that question, what's something that you're learning uh, or hearing that will help you make policy progress or overcome a barrier or challenge in your place of work. Is that okay? Sorry about that, um, techie things. Is, and hopefully everybody else is, is all right, not uh, having too many barriers with that. Um, great, so I'd like now to pass over to Martin Elliott, um, who is the Head of Strategic Planning at Leeds City Council. So we're really, really pleased to have you here, Martin, and giving your perspective as a, as a senior plan owner city. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna now hopefully share my slides uh, without a hitch, I'll put that into present mode and go back one. Can I get some thumbs up or some, yes, we can see that, brilliant, thank you. So um, so I've been asked to um, to talk about plan making and what, what, what local plan making um, can do for food. Um, please come back to me if um, this is uh, technical, I will try not to use acronyms. Planners love acronyms, I will try and avoid them. I want to make the point first off though, um, that Leeds is at the start of its journey on thinking about planning and food. Um, and, and as you can see from the banner that we have to use for all our corporate and um, PowerPoint presentations, Leeds is a very urban city. Um, there's, there's not a lot of food growing going on um, in this picture you see in front of you. Um, hopefully that will change. Um, and if we get some really good food growing policies um, in our plan, we might have to update um, this banner in due course. Planning um, and the planning system in this country is governed by the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, and Maddie's sort of touched on, 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 on that um, already. But you've got to really, really look hard for national guidance of, on um, food and food production. It really comes in, in two forms in the National Planning Policy Framework. It, it, it's very much linked to healthy, inclusive and safe places. Um, which is what Maddie was talking about in terms of design uh, and the government's recognition that food um, can fit within in, in well-designed places. But it talks about access to healthier food and allotments. And there's also a recognition that undeveloped land can perform many functions, um, such as food production. Um, and that undeveloped land being chiefly um, in urban areas. So not a lot of guidance from the NPPF, as we call it. And, and as I'll sort of come back to later on, a stronger platform for planning policies for food production 
will help de-risk um, getting policies into local plans because getting policies into local plans is rather a complicated and time-consuming process and often fraught with objection um, and, um, and, and, and difficulty. So what we're doing in, in, in Leeds, what I do as a spatial planner, is I implement the issues that are important to my local authority. Um, and I do that through the local plan, not necessarily as it relates to a grant of planning permission, which is the typical planning policy, which is to achieve planning permission, you must do this but policies that are probably a little bit more promotional uh, and inspirational within this particular arena. So I'll talk a little bit more about what we're thinking about that. Um, but Leeds is local authority strategy is governed by three pillars. We've got a climate emergency because we're going to run out of our carbon budget to 2050 in 2029, help. Um, we've got health and wellbeing strategy, placing real importance on um, the resilience of our local places, um, especially post pandemic. And we've got an inclusive growth focus, which is about looking at ideas around the circular economy and, and looking at making sure that all parts of Leeds have opportunities to be productive um, and um, be able to access homes um, and good jobs. We've also got within Leeds some key priority neighborhoods where indices of multiple deprivation reveal that they are among the lowest uh, nationally. We've just started um, part of that kind of corporate um, agenda, looking at a local food strategy with a range of partners. We've got a draft vision, which I won't read out. You can, you can see for yourself. But there's two parts of um, that local food strategy that planning is really going to help implement. One of them is around supporting greater local growing. Obviously that involves the use of land uh, and planning helps control the use of land. Um, the second is around improving the city's supply chain. Uh, and that's about looking at a food strategy and food production as one would look at the important economic sectors within a city and looking at the necessary infrastructure in order to support that. There's reasonable amount of good practice going on already within Leeds. The picture there shows the Mill Hill Chapel within Leeds and the Living Walls scheme, which is looking at hydroponics to grow about 3,000 plants per month. And those plants then get used to supply local food banks and organisations um, such as those that are providing for uh, the refugees. Um, in terms of the local plan, we don't really have any policies at the moment in our statutory local development plan for food, um, other than what I think is the kind of the, the standard policy around protection of allotments. Um, but we are looking at integrating um, those policies through our current Leeds local plan update. The links there on the slide, feel free to go and have a look at the um, material around that. We're at an early stage of that um, production but we're looking at drafting policies um, this summer. This is very much around zero carbon ambitions, but it, it is also looking at tackling an ecological emergency as well. In terms of policies for food, I see those falling into three main topics. The first is policies around placemaking and design. We, like many other local authorities, have realized that the quality of our places um, and the new development that's being built isn't great. Um, there have been various reports around um, the poor quality of housing uh, and new development, which is why the government set up the National Model Design Code. We're also looking at 20 minute neighbourhoods as a precursor for growth to ensure that any new growth both operates as a critical mass for centres and places, but also uh, importantly um, enables uh, neighbourhoods to be accessed by public transport. So growth in a way that then attracts infrastructure to come to it rather than growth uh, and uh, challenge of actually um, bringing that infrastructure along where it doesn't have that critical mass. And, th and the third element where food fits in is green infrastructure. And we, we talk about that in terms of multifunctional and multifaceted green infrastructure. And that goes from the very strategic level in Leeds right the way down to individual housing developments. One of the things that 
um, is important. Um, it, it, it is that the climate vulnerabilities that we have in Leeds, thinking not so much about mitigating carbon, but thinking about living with um, the effects of climate change are very spatial. And I wanted to share what looks like a horrendously complicated graph, but, but actually is relatively straightforward. There's, there's 33 wards in Leeds toward the um, left-hand side uh, of that graph, um, where you've got the tall green lines, they show the more affluent wards in the outer areas of Leeds, where there's more access to uh, green space, open space, where the sensitivity to things like um, increased air pollution, because there's less incidence of um, respiratory illness, for example, uh, and where the capacity of people to be able to deal with um, climate change is higher, um, provides a much rosier picture than to the right hand side of, of that graph, where the capacity for people to be able to, to deal with hotter summers, uh, worsening air pollution, etc., cetera, um, is, is exacerbated by their health um, and also by their um, ability to, to, to kind of mobilize uh, and become empowered to do something about that at a local level. And that's a, a really important message for us as we look to um, implement planning policy across the city. And, and basically, if we're looking at more food growing, it makes much more sense for us to be looking at urban food growing within the inner city areas, um, because that has multiple benefits, not only to health and well-being, but also to um, to air quality as well. So um, what, 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 um, I want to talk a little bit about what the different parts of the planning system can do. Talk a bit about local plans, a bit about neighbourhood plans and a bit about supplementary planning documents, because the three of them working together are, are really important in articulating um, local food strategies. So within our local plan at the moment, uh, I think it's really important that you just have a strategic policy that recognises that this is an issue uh, and, and, and recognises that um, there's positivity about local food production and local supply chains and also protection for spaces that have the potential to become food growing spaces. Too often, I think, in planning, um, green spaces are lost because they haven't got an immediate recreational value. But I think in Leeds, we're talking about the wider multifunctionality of those green spaces, um, including food production. So that positive framework will um, set out opportunity areas um, for the delivery of, of, of food. As I said earlier, food as a sector in its own right, um, a framework to uh, bring forward community projects, but also commercial projects as well. One of the things we're looking at through the local plan update is um, geothermal heat and the potential to correspond where our geothermal heat is, 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 is viable um, with opportunities for um, commercial growing um, projects indoors, uh, for example so that um, we're not uh, using um, uh, uh, non-renewable sources um, to, 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 to grow more food. Uh, and a focus on brownfield land as well as um, saying something meaningful about what the green belt is for um, in terms of food production. We're also looking at development management policies as well, um, so that when developers come to us with housing developments, one of the opportunities for us um, to, to, to look at food growing as part of that. That, as you can imagine, comes in a, a range of different sizes and scales. And the smaller housing developments where we're encouraging fruit trees to be planted in, in all gardens, larger developments where we're looking to encourage land to be set aside um, for food growing. Neighbourhood plans at Leeds is really quite um, uh, sort of popular for neighbourhood plans. We've got over 50 in production with nearly 37 made plans within Leeds. I think the point there is we're having lots of discussions about food security and, and food policies within our neighbourhood plans and with our groups. Um, and I think it's an issue that actually makes planning real for people. It's something that's really relevant to their everyday lives. And I think it's something that we're getting a lot of traction within our neighbourhood plans for, be it moment we're not we're not actually seeing um, many neighborhood plans come through with with final policies but one thing I wanted just to um, 
to, to make a point about is, is if we're looking at food through a neighborhood plan, it depend whether you've got a parish neighborhood plan area or whether you've got a neighborhood forum. Um, and that goes to the longevity of implementing um, some of the, the food growing policies and projects within the neighborhood plans. Sometimes where we have a neighborhood forum, we find that that forum disbands once the plan is made and, and they're not there to provide that long term support um, and inspiration um, to a local area as regards food production. One of the key things that two um, minutes, neighborhood plans, two minutes, Martin. That's all right. One of the key things neighborhood plans can do is they can attract money and use local community infrastructure levy to help um, win projects. Um, supplementary planning documents um, are a really important part of the process as well. They often sit sort of at, at sort of the lower level, but they're a really good way of setting detailed guidance and sharing good practice. So they're also a critical part of the, the system. I just want two, or two slides now just to set out some of the issues really. One I think is around how we position the topic of food security. It's not just environmental, just social, just economic. It cuts across all of them, but the development industry tends to see it um, as a single issue, either as a, as, as a social issue, if it's around allotments, for example, uh, or as an environmental issue. It does need to be seen across them all. I think one of the difficulties we've got in planning is the tests of soundness that are set for us within the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, and I think there's an opportunity within the positively prepared test for us to really look at what our objectively assessed needs for food are and treat food more as infrastructure. So we're not just looking at planning for numbers of homes, numbers of jobs, um, amount of road space, et cetera. Actually, we can quantify the amount of food we need to support ourselves. I think if work is done on that, it's going to make food security policies much easier to implement. I think we also need to start looking at judicious use of greenfield land um, and where it may be appropriate to develop um, in the countryside in order to, to lever in investment for food, because a lot of developers hold on to hope value um, with sites close to urban areas. So there, there maybe has to be some sort of give and take in terms of release of some of that land. And one of the um, ideas we're looking at in Leeds at the moment within the urban area, is looking at urban exception policy that allows limited amount of affordable housing on greenfield land release, in the main urban area, if that comes alongside um, working the land as well, so that you're providing that low cost housing to, um, to actually um, support farm workers. Um, so a few conclusions. We're in the early days of this. Um, it's been really interesting talking to um, the group uh, today. Um, I think bringing the wider local food strategy and spatial planning together is really important. Um, you can't all do it um, through one document or one route. Um, and uh, I think it's really helpful to think about different types of planning policies that we might need in order to um, deliver this agenda. And I look forward to coming back once we've got some policies in place um, and um, hopefully tell you a bit more about them in the future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Martin. That's really, really great. Um, does anyone have a, we've got a minute or two for a question for Martin. Um, or you can hold on to it for later on, or does anyone have a... Deborah. Deborah, do you want to come in? Great. Sorry, I was having trouble with my, my mouse then. Yeah, no, that was absolutely brilliant and fascinating. Um, and I really like the fact that you talked about multifunctional use of green spaces because there is a lot of competing demands, you know, on, on the, the dwindling amount of uh, urban and peri-urban green space. And um, I just wanted to make a plea to make sure that um, biodiversity is, is taken into account when assessing the opportunity mapping 
um, for sites for food growing and, you know, that proper kind of surveys are done. And, you know, ideally what we're trying to achieve in Swansea is where we tick multiple boxes. So we might have a, you know, a bit of peri-urban green space that can be good for food growing, for biodiversity, for carbon, for flood alleviation, you know, air quality. And, you know, the more boxes you can tick, the more support you're going to get and the more funding you're going to get and the more sustainable it is. So I, I was really pleased to hear you mention that kind of uh, multifunctional approach. But uh, as, as an ecologist, I just make a plea that we don't plant food on priority habitats. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a thumbs up from Martin. Brilliant. Um, Emily. Thanks. Um, yeah, great presentation, Martin. Really interesting. I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that last thing, the um, urban exception sites, because um, for people who don't know, rural exception sites are when you you can put in kind of low cost housing or sorry, you can allow housing in a place you might not allow it otherwise, is my understanding. So, you know, for tied farm workers and for specific uses and I just wasn't quite clear how that works in an urban area. Yeah that, that's correct Emily so it's, it's, it's using that idea of, of, of linking the um, the workers that are needed to, to successfully bring about the food growing in an urban situation with the need for affordable housing. Um, we find it very difficult to deliver the right levels of affordable housing in Leeds um, at, at any great scale um, and just because you're in the inner city doesn't mean that you've, you've got housing that's affordable to you because your salary can still be some way from, from the average cost of housing in that area. So a way of linking the specifically that home ownership or home rental um, with the, the activity that's, that's going on on the land, potentially through a release of a small part of green space um, that, 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 that would otherwise have gone to another use. For, for a small amount of housing to, to facilitate that is something that we're, we're, we're currently looking at. Thanks. That's really interesting. Definitely. Um, Tony, have you got a, a quick one? Uh, yes, I think maybe we can pick it up during the rest of the day, but I was really interested in the, um, the, the short supply chain and the infrastructure uh, that you were talking about and what that means for a 20 minute neighborhood. Uh, and really, are we talking about sort of a farmer's market in every neighbourhood or uh, planning permission that makes it really easy for food hubs to, to establish or community cafes or, yeah, so what, what does the infrastructure look like, I guess, for a 20 minute community is my question. That's a really huge question, Tony, and it's probably one that is worth leaving um, to, to, to the discussion, but, but, but I, think, I think when we talk about infrastructure, um, we, we, we tend not to think about it in terms of food supply chains, um, access to local food, um, access to space for growing food. So it's bringing that the food agenda into the way we, we think about infrastructure. So when we think about new development, we think about doctor surgery, schools, public transport, roads, let's add food to that list. And if we can quantify what those needs are, you, you get a much better evidence base and potentially a, a, um, a less risky progress through plan making um, because planners love evidence and not just planners, but the planning inspectorate who will test the plan need evidence because there's people out there that will object to whatever you're doing. So evidence talks, that makes sense? Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks everyone and thank you, Martin. I'm gonna hand over to Lucy uh, Taylor now, who is the coordinator of the Community Land Advisory Service in Wales with a bit of a overview of what's going on across the UK. Um, over to you, Lucy. Hi, Hi thanks, Mardi. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I'll just uh, minimize this and uh, well, share my screen first. Great, great. <clears throat> so um, I just wanted to take the opportunity just to describe um, social farms and gardens. Um, yeah, I, the Community Land Advisory Service is, is managed by social farms and gardens, and I've been the coordinator since we gained funding in 2018 from the big lottery. 
um, we're now funded by the Outdoor Recreation Branch um, of Welsh Government, and it's all about increasing access to land for all community-led green space projects, but demand means that 90% of those projects have some type of food growing um, in them. Uh, but so those projects range from community supported farms to community allotments, orchards, wildflower meadows, tiny raised bed projects and, you know, all sorts of um, uh, different types of food growing. Um, and it's about increasing access to land so people can do that um, through negotiating with public and private landowners, leases, licenses to occupy and planning permissions and that's my background i worked in local authority um departments for about 15 years um a little bit in the private sector as well before i came here nine years ago so um <clears throat> just moving on uh quickly um um we just um i was just gonna say something about you know where we where we're at um at, at the current time in terms of uh food growing spaces in urban areas. Um, <clears throat> we've gone from one and a half million plots during war times to a severe shortage of allotment plots across the UK. Um, I don't know if anyone saw Monday morning's breakfast show. They highlighted the recent APSI report, which advised that 94% of allotment authorities have reported an obvious increase in demand uh, for, food, for growing space since the pandemic. 38% of council waiting lists are over a 1,000 people, and the average wait time is reported to be 18 months. Um, and with the rising cost of living, obviously the terrible war in Ukraine, um, it's only going to increase demand further. Um, the National Allotment Society, who I believe are represented here today, um, recommend 20 plots per 1,000 people. Um, and, you know, I know in Wales, the average figure is only about 5.1 plots um, per 1,000 people. And that's based on some baseline study work that we did um, in 2020 for Welsh Government. Um, so um, with, the, with, inc with decreased resources and capital funding for local authorities, communities are now wanting to take on land for food, community food growing projects for themselves, for their neighbours, their friends, local groups and, and, and those in need. Um, <clears throat> um, just talking about the notion of um, community food strategies, I think Scotland are leading the way on this through the... Uh, the Community Empowerment Act uh, 2015, which requires all the, each local authority to prepare a, a food, food growing strategy for its area. Um, great to see Leeds are thinking along those lines. And um, what they do in Scotland is, is to identify land that, that, that may be used for, as allotment sites. They identify their other areas of land that could be used for community growing and describe um, how the authority intends to increase provision for community growing, in particular in areas which have um, social and economic deprivation. Uh, it's a great document, the Edinburgh one, uh, worth a read if you're looking for sort of policy examples and um, hooks for, for, get, for planning policy, how things could work. <clears throat> so um, just, just to touch on why we why we might increase food in and around our settlements. Um, well, I think referring to some of the things like 80% of our food is from where, um, it's from imports, but um, obviously we've got this, this problem with resilience to change and all the things that are going on in the world and evidence is showing that people want to eat um, healthier, more local food. Um, the main reason I think people want to access spaces um, is perhaps because the space, you know, the food, uh, food is something they want to do and they feel that um, the space is underutilised and they want the land around where they live to provide a better facility representing the needs and size of their community. Um, with a great greater awareness of changes and crisis going on in the world, people initially want to feel more resilient, um, but then they 
feel that using their own ideas can make a positive impact on the local area. And once they get a fork in the ground, the ben benefits become abundant socially. They feel far less isolated and, and connected and they're, they're much more connected to people in nature around them and they feel a, a real sense of purpose and pride. Um, the projects I, I've only ever, the projects I've ever encountered, encountered want to work with nature and not against it. They use peat-free soil, they rainwater harvest, they create places for pollination, bird motels and beehives. But um, many people feel that they've also acquired new skills and, and they want to share that knowledge and, and those skills and impart that to other people. Um, some projects like Pennon Valley Organic Adventures also pro provide um, accredited courses, outdoor classrooms for excluded children and help people get back into work. I just um, inserted um, <clears throat> this additional so a slide here, um, which is a word cloud I've created from um, dialogue in some short films that were made uh, by the 15 community management um, of land awardees. On the 16th of March, we awarded 15 projects. Um, it's the third year we've done it for managing space in, in their communities. Um, and as you can see, these these are the words that people are using in their films. Um, it's there's not much bad there socially, environmentally, and, and economically. Um, there's obviously all good good sort of reasons there. Um, moving on swiftly, so along with things like this, um, perhaps we could we need to see a bit more of of this sort of thing. Um, the first picture on the left is um, the Edinburgh Food Growing Strategy, as I've talked about. Um, it's, it's, it's identified existing, but also potential food growing sites, which I think a lot of local authorities find um, challenging, um, various barriers in the way of, of doing that, that sort of thing. And that's, I suppose, certainly something for um, local planning authorities to think about. And then the second image, I'm sure our, our colleagues who are here today from Brighton and Hove will, will recognise is uh, from the planning advisory note on food growing, um, which was updated in, in September 2020 and refers to the whole design residential design guide, which helpfully provides illustrations of how food growing can be incorporated into even the smallest of housing developments. Um, <clears throat> and um, lot, I, I, Building on this, um, just wanted to say that there's obviously lots going on around the UK. And as Jeremy mentioned, there is um, uh, the the founder of Incredible Edible Movement is is in um, London today, persuading peers in the House of Lords. And one of our Wales managers has gone along to help her um, persuade the peers to of a right to grow on land which is not being used or isn't being is isn't sort of being currently being developed um i suppose it's an ambitious suggestion and one that we may not be quite ready for but we need to certainly be thinking about community food strategies and we know here in wales whilst government have already begun work on community food strategy for wales which will encourage local authorities to act um, this is um, this slide talks about a potential case for um, the um, a fields in trust standard for allotments and food growing spaces across the UK. So, like the sort of the famous six acre standard for open spaces, could there be a standard for the number of growing spaces within a certain distance of where people all live, live, or per a thousand people? Um, in an area, um, we we've done a lot of work on baseline stuff in the last two or three years here in Wales, and um, I understand that it would be a quite a, you know a challenge to do, to do that in England. Um, but yeah, if you've got the evidence, then perhaps you know something like this could be thought about. Um, so, like in Brighton and Hove planning advice note on food growing and development, new developers new developments would need to provide food growing spaces in their housing schemes on a, on a more widespread basis. Um, 
obviously I've said in Wales, we've done baseline figures for allotments and growing spaces across Wales because our First Minister has pledged to double the amount of allotments and growing spaces across Wales in his administrative term, in his five years. So it's quite an interesting commitment. And um, because we have this information now, it's possible to sort of compare, contrast and get local authority areas having more growing spaces, but not, you know, the standard, I don't think should be a burden, you know, like um, local authorities find it hard to provide um, playing fields, um, you know, and, and try to get developers to provide playing fields and other green spaces. We could also get them, get them thinking about providing flexible growing spaces for new, new communities to take on, having been a, a, a member of a new community once um, a few years back myself, it, we were prime for managing a community garden and, and because of bureaucracy and people not wanting to take responsibility um, because the house was built by three different house build, the, the I should say the, the site was built by three different house builders. Um, the local authority had problems getting them to bring the green spaces up to standard and seven years later, we'd lost momentum then, but we were really enthusiastic to have a, a community garden for ourselves. And I think those people who come into a new development are, you know, really primed for that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, it's about providing these flexible spaces for communities on top of sort of schools and affordable housing. These, these green spaces and to be a bit more flexible for food growing if that was, that's what that community wants to do. And um, rather than sort of burying low rubble underneath the green space, you've got to think about it, could it be used for fruit growing? Um, just one more minute, Lucy. Okay. Um, and, you know, just going a bit further, we could even look to be ambitious for suggesting that greenfield housing development on agricultural land next to settlements needs to provide us a percentage of local land for food growing. If we have the evidence, why not? Um, <clears throat> going to these are some pol planning policy hooks i'm not going to say about too much about those um but um yeah there's lots of hooks for planning policy out there and um just i was just going to mention something about the um Monmouthshire food action plan which which talks about climate change strategy and how the council feel the action plan will be an, an important component in addressing the um, emergency, the climate emergency by promoting food growing and, and sustainable land management and agricultural practices. They then refer to uh, the, the food development action plan in their corporate business plan. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's an opportunity then for the revised develop, deposit local development plan um, which is due soon to perhaps incorporate some some policies um, this is i'm just going to leave you with the uh, um the brighton and hove uh planning advice note on food growing and development um which uh i'm sure colleagues elsewhere can uh from from brighton can certainly um provide us with more detail on but um i encourage you to, to have, have read. it's been updated in more recent times so um yeah and what, one of the things i really like about it is that they're um looking for developers to gain credits and under the bre home quality mark um by by providing food growing spaces so that places are more livable and there's social interaction and active leisure opportunities and and again they do actually refer to food growing to, you know as, as an opportunity and not to be placed as an additional fi financial burden on development OK, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, Emily's just added a note into the chat you might have seen that she led on the Brighton and Hove work with the PAN, um, just highlighting that developers there are encouraged rather than required to provide food growing space. So that's a in, in really important distinction and definitely yeah. shows a, um, a way forward as well um brilliant thank you has anyone got any any quick um uh, questions a question for lucy on anything she's presented 
yeah, I wish we could make it required. So, yeah. Mm. Great. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Lucy. That's really okay. good. And and um, can we share those slides on our yeah yeah it's fine on our website. Um, Fantastic. Okay, right. Just looking at the chat. So we're going to um, pass over now for another another rich ingredient to put into our pot today. Um, I'm going to pass to Simon Rustin, who is a planning consultant um, with a few nice niche specialisms one of which is um, food production. Uh, in, and he's working with us at the Urban Agriculture Consortium and some of our city partners to be a kind of bridge between the food partnerships and the planning departments, um, which is a really critical link, really interesting piece of work. Um, it's quite, quite new for us. So really grateful to Simon for stepping into that space. and. Um, Hand over to you, Simon. Good afternoon. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you very much for, for inviting me to come and do a bit of talking. Um, as, funnily enough, since, since the pandemic happened, I've, I've given evidence over Zoom, but I've never presented on Zoom. So you're going to have to bear with me. You may also be able to hear my three-year-old in the background who's currently watching a film who unexpectedly turned up at my office this afternoon. Um, so so if, you, if you can hear the sounds of Vivo, um, I do apologise. Um, I'm going to talk without slides. Um, but if there's particular points that anyone's interested in um, that, that you want me to send you links to, um, I will put my email address in the chat. I've also got uh, three documents that I'm going to be referring to, which we'll send out as well. Um, so I've called what I'm talking about legal considerations relevant to planning for urban food systems, pathways to climate mitigation and equal opportunities. Um, so what I want to think about is the legal framework that should underpin any work on urban food systems and the planning system. And my take on it is, is that there's two relevant areas of law, which I think can assist us in our approach to these, these kind of issues. And, and, and I think what these areas of law enable us to do is to put social justice at the heart of climate change mitigation. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the law with regard to the climate crisis and the relevance of declarations of climate emergencies, which many local authorities have. And the second point that I want to touch on is the Equality Act 2010 and how this can ensure that the act access to land and food achieves substantive equality. So, um, taking climate crisis and the law first, um, I guess I guess there's a couple of things. The first one is it'll be helpful just to briefly touch upon the policy and law with regard to climate change. And I'm working on the premise here that urban food, produ food production has positive climate benefits. Um, but I'm reliant on the on the work of others to prove this. Um, and I will just put a few links into the chat, uh, which I was passed this morning for anyone that needs um, a little bit of assistance on that particular point. Um, which is uh, also another way of explaining that I don't understand planning, but I have not got the first clue how to grow anything. Um, so the, the first point is, is the national planning policy framework. Um, and actually, there is one, one other thing I should, I, I should point out here is that um, the, there's a difference between um, English planning policy, which is what I'm going to refer to, um, and, uh, and planning system in Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Um, and furthermore, there are specific um, legislation which has relevance in Wales. So for instance, the Future Generations Act 
and also some of the Scottish land reform um, legislation is also pretty relevant. But for our purposes today, I'm going to concentrate on English planning policy um, and the and the associated legislation with regard to climate change. But the Equalities Act that I'm going to refer to is 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 UK wide. So anyhow, that caveat aside. Um, so first of all, paragraph 152 of the National Planning Policy Framework talks about how the planning system should support the transition to a low carbon future in a clean changing climate, taking full account of flood risk and coastal change. It should help to, and this is the key part, shape places in ways that contribute to radical reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, minimise vulnerability and improve resilience. Um, and then it and, and then it goes on to list a few other things which aren't necessarily relevant to, to what we're talking about. But but the point is, is that there's a definite policy encouragement for anything which uh, contributes to the mitigation or adaptation to climate change. Um, paragraph 153, um, plan should take a pro, uh, should take a proactive approach to mitigating adapting to climate change in is a, is a legitimate planning consideration. Oh, sorry, I read double-sided notes. I started reading something completely different. Um, sorry, plan should take a proactive approach to mitigating and adapting to climate change, taking into account the long-term long implications of flood risk, coastal change, water supply, biodiversity, biodiversity and landscapes, and the risk of overheating from rising temperatures. Policy should support appropriate measures to ensure the future resilience of communities and infrastructure to climate change impacts, such as providing space for physical protection measures or making provision for the possible future relocation of vulnerable development infrastructure. Um, now, the, the second part of that is, isn't particularly relevant, but I think the, the point on appropriate measures for future resilience um, is, is quite useful. And then a paragraph 154, which is um, which states new development should be planned for in ways that avoid increased vulnerability to the range of impacts arriving from, arising from climate change. Um, so, and then it goes on to talk about green infrastructure. Now, that's the, the, the policy side of things. The law is also quite relevant as well, um, because Section 19 of the 2004 Planning Act has been amended by another act. But anyhow, the, the, the key point for our purposes is, is what the relevant legislation states is that development plan documents must, taken as a whole, include policies designed to secure the development and the use of land in the local planning authorities area, contribute to the mitigation and adaption to climate change. Now, all of that gives us excellent justification um, for measures which bring about sustainable urban food growing. Um, and and, and, and in my, my argument would be, well, actually, th this sort of demands it and requires it. Um, so um, to support the proposition, there is some relevant case law, which was a case called McLennan, which was all about solar panels, and I will send this out. Uh, essentially, someone erected house uh, erected solar panels on their roof. A neighbour applied for planning permission for an extension, which would reduce the light of light going to the, to the solar panels. Now, what the court was asked to decide is whether climate change is a legitimate material consideration in 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 planning, and the court decided unsurprisingly based on what I've gone through already, that it was. Um, and actually, even though what the National Planning Policy Framework and Section 19 are talking about are pretty broad in, in, in the way they're put, that doesn't mean that you can kind of forget them when it comes to the specifics of, of individual planning matters. Um, so, now I want to turn to what, how, how, how does this get applied and what weight should be given? So in planning, um, 
we talk about things having weights and what weight should be given them to them and you know and that can be anything from very limited weight to great weight or substantial weight or significant weight um and and as planners we often find ourselves um going home of the evening and asking what weight we should be given to dinner and, and and things like that but anyhow in this in this case um the risk there's research by the environmental law foundation which has indicated that around 79 percent of uk local authorities have now declared a climate emergency and i will send round that report which is which is relatively useful um so the, the question is is what does that mean and the the point that i've been making to planning inspectors and hearings is that the use of the word emergency should indicate that substantial weight should be given to an issue now that's in decision making on on different planning applications for small farms um, and for plan making there are already a number of councils who have specific climate emergency documents um and so so the what what i guess the, the the concluding point on this is that we have policy and law which can give us very useful support when we're arguing for these kinds of measures in local plans or when we're making decisions on them and that where a council has declared a climate emergency um then that into my mind should add further weight to it um final comment on this is and this is mainly aimed at local councils for, for a declaration to have legal weight careful drafting with stated aims and targets may be helpful so for those trying to advocate for um such declarations may want to consider the, the wording and the drafting to, if they wanted to have any kind of legal force um right second point is um how how can we use equalities legislation when when thinking about this um now public authorities are, are going to be subject to the public sector equality duty so what that means is that in the exercise of their functions they need to have due regard to three things to eliminate unlawful discrimination harassment and victimization and other conduct prohibited by the act advance equality of and this is the key bit for our purposes advance equality of opportunity between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not and foster good relations between people as well so for those who don't know protected characteristics are things such as ethnic identity or gender or age um or disability uh, um etc cetera, etc cetera. um so the act goes on to explain that having due regard for advancing and quality and equality involves removing or minimizing disadvantages suffered by people due to their protected characteristics taking steps to meet the needs from of people from protected groups where these are different from the needs to other groups and encouraging people from protected groups to participate in public life or in other activities where their participation is disproportionately low so at, at this point some people may be wondering what this has got to do with urban food systems and the answer is this um, a, a 2017 report by the policy exchange concluded that agriculture is the least diverse sector in the uk with 1.4 percent of farmers being non-white and that the least diverse jobs all tend to be tied to animals or outdoor or skilled crafts similarly the office of national statistics data from 2016 to 2019 finds that one percent of british agricultural workers are from black and minor minority ethnic backgrounds um now this is a really under researched and not really thought about area so far and i would really encourage people to have a look at the roots into food growing report which um i can send out to understand some of the challenges that are faced by um, BIPOC people when it comes to being able to grow food. Um, and, it, and it's pretty illuminating um, and, and it's really, really quite important to read it. Um, as for what the practical application is into planning policy and decisions, 
The answer is, is that I don't actually know what the precise answers are, but I think it's a very important to be questioned, to be asking in the first place. Um, but I would suggest that a good place for local authorities to be starting is to be reaching out to the communities in those areas to ask them what they might need. This might be expressly seeking to consult with minority communities on planning policy with regard to food, but food growing. Um, and the final point I would make on, on this particular issue is that whilst voluntary sectors organisations aren't subject to the public sector equality duty, I would still encourage people that is important to advocate for great, greater diversity in urban food systems and that this would require careful reflection on, on how best to do this. Um, so that is my um, whistle-stop tour on climate change policy and legislation and uh, equality legis um, legislation. Um, thank you for, for listening. Great, thank you very much, Simon. That was really brilliant, really opened out the thinking um do does would anyone like to um raise a, a question or have a reaction to anything that simon has raised there'll be lots of thoughts all churning around um, mulching in our brains, all that information. I've put, um, there have been some really good links put into the chat. I've put a few, some really good evidence sources that Elizabeth has also contributed into the chat. Um, look, particularly looking at uh, the sort of quality of food. Um, issues as well and how to bring that into decisions um brilliant thank you very much simon that's really really um really great so um we're going to just take a five minute break have a stretch and a cup of tea um anything you want to put in that mentimeter as well uh log it um now's a quite a good time to just put those in um when we come back we'll be um going into breakout rooms and having more small group discussion about all of this um inspired by what you've heard and what you yourselves are bringing um to each other um, and then after breakout rooms, we'll introduce a, another Mentimeter question where what we did last at the last ping was that we all fed into um, our sort of what would we like to see in our ideal kind of policy or policies um, relating to food and planning in this case. Um, and so we will just what might uh, what are the important kind of clauses would you like to have in there and you can be as kind of completely um as expansive in your wishing as as you want to be in in this space and then we'll sort of co-create some kind of ideal uh policy mishmash that then we can we can share afterwards and you could actually draw upon in your work knowing that it's come from all of your brains and all of your experience and you can then you can uh, you can use that wherever you are so um yeah so let's have a short break and then we'll come back and go into our, our breakout rooms so see you it's 3 30 see you in five minutes
Right, welcome back, everyone, if you're there. Just let us know that you're there. It's good to just have a little pause, isn't it? And a little breather. Just ground ourselves a little bit. There's a lot of, lot of head work going on. And we're all doing really important work. I think it's really important to say that by bringing, by coming together, having moments to come together and find connections, we can sort of, yeah, amplify what we're doing and remember how important it is and how complex it is as well. So, um, yeah, it's good to have shared, shared spaces. So thanks to all our brilliant presenters um, for all that food for thought. And we're going to, I'm going to open breakout rooms and there should be like four or five people in each one. And there's a couple of questions I'd like you to try to cover. So I'm just putting them in the chat and we're going to have um, 40, I think about 20 minutes, something like that. So a, a fair amount of time, uh, although they always fly by very quickly in breakout rooms. Um, so the question is, question one is what powers, levers, relationships and tools, um, narratives as well, perhaps, could planning departments use to accelerate local food production, which is sort of shorthand for, you know, the kind of food production that also increases biodiversity, that increases uh, health and well-being, that increases food security. Um, all of that stuff, sort of paraphrased in the term local food production. So maybe if we take that one first, um, and then after 10 minutes, have a look at, and they, they're quite intertwined as well, of course, what powers, levers, relationships and tools could planning departments and maybe other departments connected to planning, there's not, not uh, reinforcing silos here, but, um, and yeah, maybe re about relationships with other departments or other players, et cetera. Um, what could be done to prevent or limit or reduce food production that harms health and the natural world? So I'd say keep the kind of emphasis on question one, um, but it's also that, so that it's important to limit what is not serving us as well. And um, the, uh, the presentation that Jeremy talked about at the beginning about the, the kind of collusion between, in some cases, between state and governments that creates this sort of food oppression um, that where, where big industrial agriculture is, is given precedence over any other type or types that are um, essential for addressing our multiple crises. So about limiting harm as well. Um, I will open the rooms. Hopefully you'll, um, actually I'm gonna recreate them because I think a couple of people have had to jump out. Uh, okay. Um, and if you want to, um, sorry. So just also as you're in these uh, breakout rooms, just maybe work in rounds. So make sure that each person has um, their own space to speak um, and an equal space to speak. 
um, rather than sort of interrupting, hold on to your thoughts and each make, make sure that each other has, has um, an equal share in the time to share um, and just work, work kind of round the circle as it were. Um, but it's for you guys to sort of self-manage all of that. Um, so I'm going to open the rooms now. But hopefully um, you started to get some conversations going and make some connections. Um, and we're going to sort of harvest a lot of that now um, in a way that then will be shareable to everybody. Uh, if you go back to the the Mentimeter, I'm going to put it in the chat again. Um, so there we go. If you click on that link, that Mentimeter link, um, I'm going to, so we've been answering the question about what you've learned and heard so far. And we're going to move on to another question. Um, which I'm not sure. How do I do that? Um, hmm. Can, it, can people still see the see question one? Yeah, okay. Um, hmm. If anyone knows, if anyone's a Mentimeter whiz and knows how I change it to question two, if, if you just put, if you have uh, just answered test into that, then clicked next question, and then it says, please wait for the presenter to show the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, but I can't see where I'm in the back end, and it's not obvious to me how I do that. I've clicked on the second slide. And I've done it before, and I can't remember how. I'm refreshing it, and it's just not, it's just showing a little graph bobbing up and down. Are you still in present mode? Mm. No, I didn't, didn't go into present mode. Uh... Hmm. People not put in multiple answers anyway, Maddie. Can yeah. People, yeah. Can we yeah. Not just 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 read out the question and they can put the answers in the same box if you see what I mean. Um. Yes. Yes, I guess so. Um. It just seems a bit odd that yeah yeah but you know got, yeah so i've got my dog in my room and it's getting a bit fret fretful i think it might need to go in the garden excuse me okay all right so let's um Right, I'm not sure what to do, because if everyone's now got that waiting for the presenter to show the next slide thing. Um, sorry about this, guys. Mm, maybe we'll have to send it out an email afterwards or something. Unless we answer in the chat. Yeah, if I if hmm, if I go. If you click on the menti again. Does the question come up again? Same question, yeah. Same question. All right, so let's just ignore that question. Mm. And the question is, um, 
So use the Mentimeter to create an ideal policy, to create ideal policy clauses and considerations. So what would be an ideal planning or planning related policy or clause of a policy that supported local food production? So think from your, from your own context, where are the gaps um, from what you've heard? What, um, what would you love to use as a planner? What would be that, that juicy kind of clause or policy that, that would help you to um, unlock land for food production? And if you want to also put in it um, something, you know, something that it relates to your place. So if you want to also put in the name of your place at the beginning of the end, um, so that we have an idea of what kind of things would work in what places. Um, yeah, and Martin said, yeah, you can preface the answer with a uh, second or two I mean, the second question, so at least we'll know where one question ends and the next one begins. So we'll just have a bit of sort of contemplative time. Well, we kind of think and feed into this question.
Okay, so some of the things that are coming up in relation to this. Um, thinking about use of local authority or public land. A call for sites. Growing food is an end in itself. It shouldn't have to be justified in terms of planning regs. Everyone needs good food. Talking to major landowners with open space, e.g. hospitals and schools about use of their land. A national requirement to uphold a right to food system based on predominantly UK produced food. Ideal policy would require space for food growing or food growing opportunities to be provided in all new development needs to be a strong position on a scale relative to the development. Policy that prioritizes food infrastructure, markets, foods, hubs, other retail models. Something using something like the continuous productive urban landscape. Uh, framework that Lucy highlighted to help connect areas of work in a different way to local or national policy frameworks. Swansea adopting a soil-based soil production, not vertical farming. A policy that integrates biodiversity increase with food production increase and comprehensively covers production grower employment right through to supply chain and community needs. Again, recognizing and supporting all aspects of food production, not just growing space for individuals, but for communities, food processing, waste, all in a local system, a localized system. Robust criteria for sale of council farms that prioritise benefits for local communities. That's a really interesting piece. One planet development type policies for other parts of the UK. Yes. Looking at regenerative settlement framework. What is a regenerative settlement? What does that look like? Some very interesting work being done on that in uh, in England, in the, across the UK um, at the moment. Vision for local food infrastructure in a 20 minute neighborhood. Yeah, so taking the 20 minute neighborhood framework briefing and really expanding and, uh, and deepening the food aspect of that. Better sense of legal issues relating to food and planning, food system thinking. Masses of justification that this is an issue we must engage with. This helps reticent local authorities take important steps. So supporting pop-up uses as well. So we're talking about sort of meanwhile and pop-up as well as permanent. More information. Yeah, and making a distinction between high tech agri and agroecological, and there's a lot of there's a lot of um, yeah language that needs to be bottomed out. I think there's a lot of use of terms like sustainable intensification and what does that mean? Um, and you start to get into you know, how many more people, how many more jobs can we provide actually by, by increasing productivity through more people and not through more um, petrochemical based fertilizers. But bringing people back onto the land, what does that, what does that look like to have living green belts, not empty green belts? 
two-tier authorities to work together. Brilliant. There's a lot of rich stuff in there that hopefully is useful to all of you. Um, so just coming up to, we've just passed half, uh, quarter past four. I'm gonna stop sharing this. And um, I'd like to, yeah, thank you all very much for participating in this process, um, which is always intended to be quite a creative um, process that will benefit everybody. Um, in, the in the last 15 minutes, I'd just like to do something of a kind of closing round, because obviously some of us have spoken with each other, but we haven't all spoken into the same space. Um, just to, so that you could tell us what is a key thing that you're taking away from this session. Um, how, are you, how are you leaving this session? And um, what one thing are you, leading, are you taking with you? Thank you, Lucy. Lucy had to go. So, um, uh, Martin, our dance class, very important, brilliant. So, um, so yeah, let's just have a, a, a quick round before we um, go back to the rest of our lives. I'd love to hear what has landed for you in this session. Um, so if we do it like somebody, somebody start and then um, pass on to the next person. Is that okay? So just remember to pass on to somebody else when you've finished and, and then we'll hopefully get around everybody. Um, and there are about 18 of us. So if you can keep it to under a minute, something just, just pithy that you're taking away, that'd be great. Um, I'm gonna pick on someone to start. Sonia? Sure. Um, <laughs> what am I going to take away today is like I'm really thrilled with how much uh, the planning department in Leeds is doing. Um, it was really great to hear that. And I just hope um, I just look forward to the, the policies actually being developed and integrated in and recognized within the food strategy. So it feels feels really positive. Great. Do you just want to say um, who you are, where you're speaking? Oh, sorry. I'm from uh, Foodwise Leeds, the, the food partnership for the city. So this is pretty exciting stuff as we develop a food strategy for the city. Okay. Um, how about Dan? Thank you, Sonia. Um, I, I just want to say uh, how fantastic I think the session has been. Thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed it and found it massively stimulating and I wish we had longer. Um, okay, what I would like to uh, contribute is that from a specifically planning com uh, context, this is all very difficult, um, but it's been really refreshing to listen to uh, people talking, Martin particularly, about uh, new ways of looking at things. I think his suggestion that, uh, you know, the location of uh, urban food production in the inner city rather than on the urban fringe for those reasons that he gave is pretty revolutionary. So I think uh, my takeaway is that, um, you know, that there are really great opportunities to retell the story of urban food that may not always be the job of planners. Uh, and what we need to do is some kind of brokerage to uh, help planners harness uh, existing tools for new uses in the way that Martin and others have been describing. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pass to Angela. Hello. Um, I'm newly in Brighton and Hove as Food Policy Coordinator. So um, really inspired today um, by the work. And I know there is a lot going on in our area, but I think the big take home today it's it's kind of looking at um how we make connections between those things and get a kind of a flow of activity so some of the things that they, they might seem you know tough and not that <laughs> exciting like you know monitoring if if a planning um spd has been used 
But actually, then, if you ask the question, well, what's the good news there? And you get the story, like Dan says again, it keeps it alive and inspires the, ne the next person. So what, one's about um, making connections and in trying to ensure there's a flow of activity always happening. And then the other is about working in the spaces between what we're offered by the government, I guess, and policy. <laughs> and, you know, that that dynamic that the, the sum of all these projects, diverse projects and um, sites would give confidence to bigger decisions <laughs> about land use and about procurement and regenerative farming, etc. So I think that's the thing for me is keeping that always in mind, work with what we've got and then work between the spaces. Sorry, I'm supposed to pass on. Can I pass on to Deborah? Hi all, um, I'm Deb Hanny. I'm part of a local authority in the South Wales Valleys um, and we've, you know, we've been regularly hit by um, the various storms and, and uh, at risk of flooding. So some of our sort of land parcels are, are not suitable for one variety, for one reason or another. Um, what I've taken from today is the need to better knit some of our internal departments in terms of having conversations. So if we can, we, we've certainly seen a surge in um, inquiries from community groups for land parcels, for community orchards, agroforestry proposals, and smaller food uh, growing projects. So, looking at it from the you know the social value of the services being provided, the health and well-being benefits, and trying to change minds and hearts slowly internally, um, I would. Our dialogue starts with corporate estates who have the the authority for the for the land and, and building. So it's we're working with them on a new um, cap policy process at the moment. So hoping that through this new way of working, we'll start to be able to have earlier conversations with planners about the benefits of providing land for food growing initiatives. So better conversations both internally and making sure that the raft of policy and you know um good practice that's out there is shared internally with senior officers as well um and i'll hand over to joe hi there um joe dunn from the middlesbrough food partnership um and so not in planning or anything like that our local authority although we work try to work very closely with them uh one of the things i'm gonna be yeah we're looking at this quite a lot um the whole kind of planning thing um, for whole sustainable food systems and so land use is a key kind of part of that obviously um, and I you know the presentations by uh, by those that have spoken today are absolutely fantastic giving a lot more food for thought it's, it's incredible I speak it's one of the things that is just latching on to is the, the stuff that Simon was talking about in terms of the climate emergency and Middlesbrough have been uh, declared a climate emergency and as one of those 13 local authorities that have a plan in through our food partnership for to address part of that so um yeah using that as a yeah whether it's a stick to beat with or to hopefully guide it's kind of more more ammunition um to just kind of keep throwing in under their noses and hopefully something will stick and we can kind of get moving with that so um but thank you everyone really really interesting uh interesting afternoon thank you uh, i'll pass to jack Hi there, um, my name's Jack and I'm currently working with in Swansea Council as a local food officer and it's really interesting. Um, we've been having lots of different meetings and lots of different group chats like this um, and the same thing sort of gets gets brought up um, a lot about, <clears throat> especially lately and within the council we've well, they've created. I'm only five weeks into this role, so it's a it's a brand new role. They've created this role for the purpose of, um, well, the main purpose of shortening food chains. But I know what comes within that is lots of different things from different angles, and of course, we're able to speak um, with the planning in our department. So, my, what I would like to take from this is the you know getting the communication out there. So, we need to be 
I need to be out there speaking to the groups and I can go and speak to the internal members. Um, and then secondly, I would like to take, um, sorry, I just <laughs> had it on the back of my head and I've forgotten now. Um, the, yeah, so the education factor. So we, we in our breakup up group, we were talking about maybe how local authorities aren't completely understanding food network, um, uh, being able to shorten uh, supply chains and, and improve food networks. So, and how to do it regeneratively and sustainably uh, without greenwashing it as well. So we need to get those points across and and try and work work with these guys internally to to get those points across um i want to pass to sorry who hasn't been uh ian i'm just going to butt in um briefly does anyone have to go at 4 30 on the dot are you all fit flexible debris you fed back already joe rosie did you say you have to leave at half past as well um Ian, would it be all right just to get, get Rosie to um, reply before she has to go? Thank you. And then back to you, Ian, after. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Because my microphone doesn't always work. Um, just, I'm just encouraged. I'm in Leeds um, working with Sonia in, in part of this um, local community food growing groups and linking up to, lo to the council. So I, I just feel totally encouraged by the breadth of the people here and 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 the, the way that we're all kind of seems to me largely thinking similarly and and pushing all of this forward so thank you keep up the good work and see you. thank you over to you ian uh hi yeah i guess the the take on the encouragement is is that um when a council or an authority really gets their act together around food then things seem to move forward quite quickly. So you see examples that we've been given today can show you that councils can be instrumental and can can like make change happen quite quickly because what worries me is always, this is all taking too long and we're gonna be overcome by the climate uh, catastrophe before we get a chance to put some of these things in. So good examples is is, is particularly, you know, good to see. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd wanna see planners, um, always looking at say collective cooking as so as well as collective growing and and getting getting fresh produce to uh into the urban spaces i think you've got for some people they're just not going to be able to cook it for one reason or another also there's collectively eating is is very powerful because you when you get people together they have different ideas so i'd like to see that as part of planning when they're putting in new spaces there should always be a, a, a community space and there should always be an ability to to cook in each kind of ward or micro ward or whatever. Uh, Ruth Ann. Hello, um, I'm Ruth Ann and I work for NILGA, which is the Northern Ireland Local Government Association. So we represent all 11 um, councils. Um, this would be something very new for myself. No, I'm not sure about the councils, maybe they're more advanced than me but definitely for me it would be something um especially with the cost of living crisis over here has um we would get we are not the same as the uk so we don't get them the cost of living increases at the same time as you guys so we've had three so far and we're scheduled for another four by the end of the year so i think this is really important and i think we have lots of urban spaces and um different types of agricultural land that we could definitely reuse. We did have a social farming project here for a while and Miriam was on, so it was really good to connect in with her. Um, Deborah was brilliant and it was really nice to see how um, in England and Wales and Scotland you're doing it um, already. Um, so in reply to Jack, we are now starting to have poverty officers, anti-poverty officers in our councils, which is new. Um, there's only a couple of roles out at the moment, but we're hoping to get um, all 11 councils with them. So actually, um, it's been really beneficial and um, it's just really nice to meet other colleagues that are doing policy and trying to get everybody together. And for our planning officers, um, some of them, this will be totally new and um, we have to get 
Maddie and Jeremy to do a few presentations. So um, with ourselves, but definitely um, a lot to take away from. So thank you very much. And thanks everyone for your input. Oh, yes. Um, Deborah, have you worked? Yeah, I've already been. Thanks, Ruth. Who hasn't? Is that me? Yeah, <laughs> oh, there's yeah. another Deborah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes, you. <laughs> Um, is that okay? Uh, just quickly, yeah, I found it really, really very inspiring and uh, and very informative and useful. So thank you. Um, I, I guess a, a, just a few quick things, you know, that I hadn't thought about, but you know, the Martin mentioned geothermic heating, um, you know, to to support the growing stuff. You know, looking at what what each bit of land can offer in terms of cutting down carbon footprints and you know, again, multiple benefits. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned is water. So just to flag that up, you know, just curious, I mean, water is critical to food growing. So um, how do we how do we sustainably harvest water and supply water for these sites in the urban areas? That'd be something maybe, um, I don't know, no, nobody's mentioned it. Um, but I thought, I mean, Lucy talked about 94% of authorities have had an in, increased interest in community growing. That, that, that's incredible. Um, and then also, you know, I didn't know that 80% of our food was imported. I, I was a bit shocked by that too. Um, and I really liked um, the graph that Martin showed about, you know, green space and, you know, some of the health benefits and stuff like that. I think I think every authority should do that graph through each ward that it's got. I think I, th I thought that was really something I'd like to take away. And finally, um, you know, you mentioned light blocking for solar panels being maybe, a, you know, could be contested or has been held up in court what about light block blocking for growing vegetables is that the same thing great point deborah thank you who do you want to pass to how about rachel yes yeah, sorry i'm really <laughs> yes sorry rachel yes go for rachel <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Rachel. I'm a postgrad at the University of Leeds and working with Foodwise Leeds um, this summer to to um, develop a feasibility study to implement or think about implementing a farm start within the within the city. Um, and I think there's a lot of you know I heard a lot of positive movement today, especially in Leeds. And I think one of my biggest takeaways is the importance of learning from one another and the communication between them and working together within existing tools and projects um, while also allowing for flexibility when moving forward. And I can pass this on to Elizabeth. Yep, thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I think um, the for me, it's this um, the need to shift the narrative from like food poverty and food security to nutrition security. That perhaps needs to be um, emphasised um, more in you know policy and um, potential opportunity for you know just general awareness and education. Also looking at food supply chains through nutrition and health lens. And I think that will also broaden out that like the scope of what do we mean when we're talking about more growing, um, you know, in our urban or peri-urban areas, because it, it has to um, have multiple benefits. So it's not just about having local food growing, it also has to be working for, you know, improving biodiversity ideally be soil based to improve um, soil structure you know it needs to be improving so soil health plant health animal health um, improving carbon sequestration the hydrological cycle that Deborah mentioned and you know it, it's more about say councils having policies to um, ensure that people are growing food in the right way so the agroecological regen organic agriculture, you know, the type of seed that's used that's going to have greater health benefits, the way you grow the food, and then how you process the food as well to ensure you're maximizing the nutritional value of the food. 
So I think there's there's a huge scope there for sort of education and awareness um, to get into you know, more local authority work and policies. So that would be marvellous. Um, Tony, I think you haven't been. Thank you. Uh, I'm here. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, I think I'm left with two questions and one observation. So my first question is that if it's so clear and there's, there's such a body of evidence about the benefits for food growing in urban areas uh, and peri-urban areas for health, um, for well-being, for uh, local lo local economies, but for climate change, if that's true, why is this so hard? Why are we struggling so much if all of these things are so great and so and, and, and so good? So that's my first question. Uh, my observation is that within the uh, in this group, and I suspect right across the UK, we've got some planners who are really interested, really dedicated, really talented, um, and uh, you know, are really pushing this 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 forward. So my second question is, how can we help you guys who are trying to push these forwards and at councils get those messages up to where they need to be? Because what I'm hearing from a lot of people is, yeah, we just, it's difficult to communicate the priorities. It's difficult to get these priorities on, 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 the, on the agenda. So I think my question to all you guys in the councils who are really, really pushing this work is what can people like us do to help you get to where we need to be with this. So those are my comments and I'm going to pass on to uh, Jeff. That's who I'm going to pass on to. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm encouraged actually, because uh, I think what's come out of it for me, which I've known for some time, but I think it's becoming more obvious is how vast this issue is, how many uh, different facets there are to it, how many, um, you know, it's, we have to bring all of this together because we're all, we all really depend on our food supply. And I think what we've forgotten is that uh, under the banner of convenience, we've, we've ceased to uh, keep our eyes on that ball. Uh, we dropped it really we've gone to uh, in wales for instance uh, as you well know tony we're basically dairy and uh, you know hill farming with some peripheral um, vegetable and grain growing but back in the 50s there was a lot more acreage under vegetable production a lot more farmers grew their own grains and saved their own seed and so on and so forth and we seem you know that seems to be a practice that we've uh, we've all sort of, uh, I don't know, looked down upon. But actually it was a very, very, very sensible practice and it had been going on for generations. So it's only since the 1950s that we've lost that contact really with our food supply. And I think it's wrong to expect the planning system really, you know, because that's basically what we're talking about, to sort all these problems out. I think, you know, we have to look at the way land is used, the way farmers are, uh, using the land. I think we ought to move more back to a mixed farming model and help farms to do that, incentivize farms to do that, provide them with local markets, uh, provide local abattoirs, and, and, and not step back in time, but actually become more sustainable and build our own, um, uh, you know, our own connection to our food supply and, and, and actually to have local supply chains so that most of those resources stay within the local communities. You know, now this is a long term project, obviously, it's going to take decades to do that. So, and there's so many other demands, climate crisis, uh, you know, bringing back native meadows, all of these things are important, biodiversity, hedgerows. So, you know, we're not going to get any more land to do this with. <laughs> all of that's going to take place uh, on the existing land, it's going to, which is going to have to be repurposed in order to bring all of these uh, things to fruition. So I think just the magnitude of the problem and the fact that there's people in the room that obviously um, are dedicating their time and their efforts to looking into this at depth. And I hope to continue the conversation going forward. 
Um, and I will hand on to. Hmm, I think it's Helen. just Helen. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Can you see me? I'm not sure if my video is up or not. No. I can see you, but your audio is a bit funny. Okay, I'm just off mute. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's kind of rattling and a bit sort of grindy sounding. Mm. <laughs> Get closer to the um, laptop so you can hear me. Okay. Um, I think it just makes the rattly bit louder when you get closer. Um, Maybe if you take your video off. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, I'll turn my video off. I don't know if that's better at all. No, it's the same. It's the same. I think it's that time of day when children at home are using all my bandwidth. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Helen. Uh, go, go for it, Helen. Just, okay. yeah, we'll, we'll go with it. Nice. Okay, I was really interested in what Simon said about, um, you know, the additional weight that can be added when councils have declared a climate emergency. And I'm from Brighton and Hope and a policy planner, so um, and we'll, we'll be reviewing our local, well, we're starting to review our local plan this year, so whether that will give us an opportunity to have stronger policies on um, food production, possibly. So, yeah, that's my, that's my kind of take home I think. amazing thank you very much thank you so yeah really blown away by the people that have been in this session today and thank you so much for like bearing with us and going over time it's sort of yeah my takeaway is to um to manage the time better so that we can hear properly from everybody and everyone can hear everybody else because it, it's so it's so valuable so it's just balancing the kind of presentation bit with the interactive bit with yeah, yeah. the harvesting bits and then the hearing from each other bits um as best i can um so okay. that's that's one thing as much as yeah the richness of all of the all of the comments and the content um do you want to do yeah do uh net what's next jeremy yeah i mean it's a shame there's only um 13 of us left now because uh, i think what we we'll have to do is the conclusions and halfway through next time like we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll write the conclusions first and then say that no um it, what's been great for me i saw out of the room unfortunately but this started this particular getting martin to speak at this event started about two years ago when sonia said they had no traction in the local authority in Leeds city council now, it's not through our efforts that that's changed. There's been a lot of other stuff going on with climate emergency and plans, but gradually Sonia has been able to say we're part of the Urban Agriculture Consortium. And that's how we got Martin to agree to speak. And we had a pre a briefing meeting with him about three weeks ago, and he was a little bit, a little bit apprehensive about doing this. But, but and this is what I think is good about this, the ping, and I hope you'll all back this up. And Dan's already asked to have a further chat, although we have known each other for a long time. But, um, we said at the beginning, this is a safe space for people to be brave. And that is exactly what's happening is people are being brave. And what I'm really impressed about, and Rathan from, excuse my pronunciation, from Northern Ireland, we only, I only sent an invite to Nilga last Friday, I think it was, because we didn't have any contacts in Nilga or, or Cosla in Scotland. And we sent something also to the Core Cities Network and they forwarded it on to somebody else who actually didn't attend in the end, but it doesn't matter. So what I'd like you all to do and to get this message out, particularly those of you who are new in local authorities, is to amplify this message. So the next meeting we've got is the 8th of June and it's called a wing group as opposed to a ping. And it's a wider interest network. So we've got a mailing list now of three, 400, 300, I think it is. But if every one of you amplifies that message and sends it out to another three people, that would be great, or five people, or 10 people, or talk to your chief executive or whatever else it is, and actually say, look, this group has got wings. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean that. It's got, it's got something unique about it, in my experience, which is gaining traction and therefore helping to amplify. And I will go back to what I said originally about reading the article about food oppression. And I thought, hang on a minute, I haven't heard that phrase before. I've heard food justice and food security. Food oppression linked to the colonial colonial history. 
Well, you think about that and you think about what we're still putting in all the junk food, it's sugar. And where does that come from? And just today, just to close on a positive note, Kellogg's are complaining about having to uh, have their products downgraded in supermarket advertising because of the high fat and sugar content. And they're saying, they're trying to say, oh, it's okay because if people have milk, the overall quality of the food is better, the meal, they call it, the meal, haha, is better. But it's still got high quality, high quantities of fat and sugar in it, irrespective of whether you put milk or yogurt in there or not. So I think that's what we've got to fight against. But by being radical and brave and actually being prepared to be a little bit outspoken, I think we can start to shift the narrative with all the other partners out there as well. And as always, thanks, Maddie, for your excellent curation. Thanks, Jeremy. That was a brilliant con concluding um, statement. And yeah, to not be, it's, it's, it's so much of it is in the territory of what the economy is all about and, and searching for a different paradigm. And how do we go from one to another? And what's that pathway? So it's really important to hold that in our thoughts and understand that we're, you know, it's all operating within a, a an unfavorable superstructure and context, which has so much momentum behind it. But yeah. bit by bit, we're we're doing yeah. it. This is our high tech end to the meeting. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs>